What are the most typical indicators of infidelity? Which ones are you aware of? There are numerous signs, but the issue is that many can go unnoticed. My wife started being more active in the bedroom, which initially made me feel good. However, over time, I sensed something was off, and I began to think about how to handle it. The specifics of how my wife, Arlene, and I met, as well as our personal histories, aren't crucial to this story. There's no need for detailed physical descriptions either. The essential background information can be summarized in just a few paragraphs. At the heart of this narrative, Arlene and I, Austin Weston, were both 33 years old. We had been married for 11 years and had two daughters, Justine, 8, and Sile, 6. Arlene and I are slightly above average in looks, height, intelligence, and fitness, though we're not extraordinary geniuses, actors, or models. We are fortunate to enjoy a regular and fulfilling intimate relationship. Arlene worked as a corporate attorney, specializing in contract negotiations, trusts, wills, and estates. I was the vice president in charge of purchasing, including IT equipment, for a small publicly traded company. My sister, Jen, her husband Bill, and their fraternal twin daughters, Kate and Beth, seven, lived about four miles away by road, or one mile as the crow flies due to a large park and forest preserve nearby. Our children and their cousins were close and attended the same school. Despite not knowing Bill well before he began dating Jen and subsequently marrying her six months later, he had since become my closest friend. Arlene had a distinct habit when it came to managing finances and saving money. She firmly believed in investing in jewelry and art. Her common argument was that gold, platinum jewelry, and artwork are investments that one can enjoy while they appreciate. While I dabbled a bit in the stock market, the majority of our savings went into jewelry and artwork, both for her and myself, including paintings and a few sculptures. We also encouraged our relatives to give jewelry and art to our children, and we often gave them such gifts as their main presents for birthdays and Christmas, along with toys, games, books, and clothing. Given the significant value of our jewelry and art collection, we installed a sophisticated security system. This included electrically powered sensors for our 12 most valuable paintings and two prized sculptures. Additionally, we had a safe embedded in the bedroom floor, each of us with our own locked desk. Arlene held the sole key to her desk, while I had mine, and she possessed a key to the safe, with the only other copy stored in our bank safety deposit box. To ensure an uninterrupted power supply to our sensors and security system, we had both a backup generator and battery backup in place, providing double redundancy. Bill seemed to have taken inspiration from our approach, albeit in a slightly different direction. He installed high-resolution cameras at the three entrances of his house, along with a security system, although less sophisticated than ours. Arlene had an unusual habit, possibly stemming from her expertise in wills, trusts, and estates, of promptly including expensive jewelry and artwork in our wills after acquiring them. Any male jewelry would be added to my will, with the beneficiaries alternating between our daughters Justine and Sile in case Arlene passed away before me, and vice versa for female jewelry. As for artwork, we took turns bequeathing them in our wills, alternating between Arlene and myself, and again alternating between Justine and Sile as beneficiaries. This practice effectively designated some assets as mine and some as hers as you can only bequeath what you own outright. From my perspective, everything went smoothly until one Thursday evening when I arrived home from work to find Arlene there, but without the children. We enjoyed a candle at dinner. Arlene was dressed in a revealing outfit and greeted me with a kiss. Where are Justine and Sile? I innocently asked. Jen and Bill kindly took them for the night, and they'll be taken to school tomorrow. They were thrilled to have a sleepover at Kate and Beth's, Arlene replied with a mischievous smile. What are we going to do without them? I joked, pulling Arlene close and kissing her passionately in return. We'll figure something out, 
she replied, snuggling up to me. After a delightful, fun, and relaxed dinner, we decided to listen to some CDs and dance. We focused mainly on practicing slow dancing steps we had learned in weekend dance lessons and enjoyed unwinding at home. However, as Arlene began to show me more attention, our dancing came to an end. I carried her upstairs, and we got into bed. My wife gave me the best intimacy of my life. What I experienced that night cannot be expressed in words. Did you like it? she asked. What do you think? I replied, still in awe. Does the Pope poop in the woods? I replied, still reeling from the experience, but I managed to make her laugh. We went to bed, but Arlene wasn't done yet. In the middle of the night, she woke me up again, and it all happened again. Remembering this incredible experience, I can't help but recall the moment when I realized that life was about to take an unexpected turn. In the midst of our entertainment, a thought popped into my head, what did this mean to us? Will it be the same in the future, or is this just a one-time promotion? With these questions lingering in my mind, I drifted back to sleep, thinking about the possibilities that lay ahead. The next morning, Friday, Arlene was affectionate, and it made me think that the incredible night we shared was just evidence of an improvement in our bed life, promising even more exceptional experiences in the future. My cheerful demeanor and the wide grin plastered on my face, as remarked upon by several colleagues at work on Friday, took a downturn in the early afternoon when the phone rang. Austin, it's Arlene, my secretary announced over the intercom. Hello, goddess of the bedroom, I greeted. Hi there, Arlene chuckled. Hey, I'm not Greek, I retorted. No but you certainly embodied the essence of lust and passion, she teased. We exchanged more pleasantries, which eventually segued into casual conversation, and then Arlene got to the point of her call. Darling, her melodious voice conveyed over the phone, signaling the impending arrival of unwelcome news, some colleagues from the office are planning to grab dinner and drinks tonight for a team-building activity suggested by the morale consultant our company recently hired. Would you mind picking up the kids from daycare and preparing dinner? Are you not planning to come home at all? I blurted it out, my disappointment evident. I will, but I'll need to change first. Unfortunately, I won't have time to pick up the kids and cook dinner, we're meeting at the restaurant at 6.30. Please, darling, I don't want to be the only one from our group to miss out, she said, slightly annoyed. I inquired. Why such short notice? I believe it's part of the exercise, sacrificing for the team, you know, she explained, her tone becoming even more persuasive. What could I say to that? After the most incredible intimacy we'd shared, she knew I couldn't simply reject her with a hell no. I resigned myself to the inevitable. Of course, dear. We'll give you a goodbye kiss, won't we? I responded tenderly. As long as you don't try to lure me to bed, she teased. We chuckled and bid farewell. I sat bewildered at my desk. She had never socialized with her male colleagues from work before, to my knowledge. She didn't particularly like most of them, and I couldn't recall her ever inviting any of them over or mentioning a team-building consultant. It all seemed very suspicious. My cheerful demeanor and smirk vanished. I fetched the kids, prepared their favorite meal of macaroni and cheese, though I made them eat a salad, too, and we bid farewell to Arlene. We couldn't give her a proper kiss. Don't smudge my makeup or crease my dress, she giggled as she lightly kissed us on the cheek. That attire doesn't scream team building, I muttered to myself, unless the objective is something else entirely. When Arlene returned home at night, I noted the time, 1.22 a.m., hardly indicative of a simple dinner and drinks. I pretended to be asleep to avoid a confrontation. She slipped into bed wearing what seemed like an ordinary negligee and spooned me, a fact confirmed the next morning. There was no intimacy on Saturday night, but we did engage in our usual routine on Sunday and Tuesday nights. 
my pleasure decreased with every Thursday and Friday night when I went through the same routine. It's not that I don't appreciate the incredible bedtime intimacy of Thursday nights, Friday has become synonymous with a large number of team building events. During the second Friday outing, she returned only at 1.22, and on the third, at 1.51. By the fourth Friday evening, I had reached my limit. Despite the pleasure she gave me on Thursday, I couldn't help but notice the emotional detachment. While Arlene was getting ready on Friday, slipping into a sleek outfit I hadn't seen before, I expressed my feelings plainly. Arlene, I really dislike this habit of going out on Friday nights now. Dear, I've already explained the importance to you numerous times, she replied, smoothing her dress over her hips as she gazed into the mirror. I'm sorry, but I find it hard to believe that you're getting home at 11.30, the time she claimed to have returned on the previous three occasions, after just dinner and a few drinks. I'm very suspicious, and it's tearing me apart. Now, Austin, she said firmly, you have no right not to trust me. We've been married for eleven years, for God's sake, and have two kids. Do you really think I'm out there doing something improper, I don't know. But what I do know is that something feels off about all of this, I responded. The conversation grew more tense as it continued. Finally, after giving the kids a perfunctory kiss on the cheek, she headed for the door. I'm pleading with you for the sake of our marriage not to go, I said. Look, she said frustratedly, I can't back out now. I'll become the joke of the company. Let's discuss this tomorrow, and I'll address all your concerns. Or even tonight, if you stay up. So you expect me to just endure this? I retorted, my tone sour. Sweetheart, you know if we split up, I'll get custody of the kids, the house, and child support. You don't want to ruin your life over baseless suspicions, I said to her. To you, she asked, her expression defiant. You're the one tearing apart our marriage, I snapped with a frustrated expression. We'll have that conversation tonight, even if I have to wake you up, she insisted. We can't talk tonight because I won't be here when you stumble in during the early hours, I shot back. The kids and I are staying over at Jen and Bill's. Enjoy your life, I added, closing the door firmly but not slamming it. Looking through the one-way mirror of our front door, I saw Arlene, her expression puzzled, reach for the doorknob. But then she shrugged and walked back to her car parked in the driveway. Once Arlene's car disappeared from view, I called out to the girls, let's head over to Aunt Jen's for the night while Mom's at her meeting. They were ready in record time, about two minutes, and we hopped into my car, parked on the street. I had already coordinated our sleepover with Jen and Bill, they sensed something was up. Jen, thanks to her intuition, and Bill, because I gave him a brief overview. Being sharp, he pieced together the rest. After ensuring the girls were asleep, or at least quiet, by eleven o'clock, I dashed out to my car for a bottle of pills. Returning to the house by 11.20 p.m., the car was strategically parked within view of the front door security camera. Time stamping its presence around 3.30 in the morning, I was abruptly awakened by the ringing of my cell phone. Hello, I mumbled, checking the time on the alarm clock beside my bed in the guest room, which showed 3.29. The voice on the other end sounded frantic. Austin, where are you? it exclaimed. I recognized it as Arlene's. I'm at Jen's house, as I mentioned earlier. Why are you calling me at this ungodly hour? I replied, annoyance creeping into my voice. Austin, something terrible has happened. We've been robbed, Arlene sobbed. They took all our valuable art and jewelry. Quickly activating the recording app on my iPhone, I asked her to repeat the details. Why didn't you call me as soon as you found out? I demanded. I tried, she cried hysterically, but I only got home fifteen minutes ago. The house was pitch black, and I had to use a flashlight to navigate. Why the hell were you returning from a team bonding event at three o'clock in the morning? And what kind of bonding were you doing? 
I spat out, trying to convey my anger. Well, um, time just slipped away from us. We can discuss that later. Right now, you need to come home, Arlene's emotions were in turmoil. Good grief, fine. I'll be there as soon as I can. Let me get dressed, I grumbled, hanging up. I went to the restroom, got dressed, then headed out to the car, driving for about 10 or 12 minutes to reach the destination. When Arlene greeted me at the front door, her makeup was streaked from tears, and she held a flashlight as she moved towards me with open arms. I halted her with my outstretched arm and interrupted sharply, asking, Did you check the circuit breaker, Arlene? I don't know where it is, she sobbed. Get out of my way. I shouted, swiftly passing by with my own flashlight. Passing her, I inquired, Did you call 911? No, she replied sheepishly. Well, what are you waiting for? I snapped. I observed her retrieving her cell phone from her purse as I hurried past. In the basement, I discovered the main circuit breaker switched off, the backup generator in the same state, and the battery backup disconnected. Additionally, the phone line crucial for the security system was unplugged. I activated the switches, turned them on, and then reconnected the battery and phone line. All seemed to be functioning perfectly as alarms indicating the theft of numerous art pieces blared, disabling the security system. I entered the code at the front door console, answering the call from the security company. I provided the password and confirmed it was a false alarm, proceeding to inspect both the first and second floors. Arlene remained inconsolable, tears streaming down her face on the living room couch. Greet the officers at the door when they arrive and snap out of it. I shouted at her, frustration evident in my tone. As expected, not only was all our jewelry and artwork missing except for a hefty granite sculpture, but our children's prized possessions were gone as well. Even the secure safe in the master bedroom floor had been emptied. When the police arrived, I immediately provided them with my account of the situation while a female officer attempted to calm down Arlene. I informed one of the male officers about the phone call from my wife, relaying the details she had shared and identifying the missing items. I handed over a list of our valuables from my study. Meanwhile, two other male officers conducted a sweep of the house, considering the possibility that someone might still be present, a thought that hadn't occurred to me. Eventually, Arlene became composed enough to give her statement to the female officer. While she did so, I discreetly pulled aside the officer I had been speaking to and whispered, I strongly believe you should investigate my wife regarding this theft. She's the only one with access to the safe, aside from one key in our safety deposit box which I'm confident you'll find untouched. Moreover, we've been experiencing marital issues, and I wouldn't be surprised if you discovered incriminating evidence on her computer or in her locked desk. The policeman gave me a strange look before jotting it down. What kind of issues, he inquired. I suspect she's been seeing someone else on the past four Friday nights. I'm receiving a private investigator's report tomorrow, I explained sincerely. Even after warning her last night that our marriage was in jeopardy if she went out tonight, that would have been yesterday, Friday, she went anyway. It seems like she's planning to leave me and avoid dividing our assets. So, you're expecting the PI's report tomorrow, Sunday, he clarified. No, my mistake. I keep thinking it's Friday because I'm not usually woken up at 3.30 a.m. I'll receive the report around noon today, Saturday, I corrected. Could you bring me a copy at the station once you have it, he requested. Of course. I'll likely be there around 1, maybe 1.30, I assured. Great. Ask for Officer Smithson. I'll brief a robbery detective on the situation, he concluded. After the police left, I returned to Jen's house without acknowledging Arlene, ignoring her calls of where are you going, as I exited. Following a pleasant breakfast at Jen's, during which I briefed her and Bill, I brought the kids home around 10 a.m. I informed them that some of our belongings were temporarily missing, 
assuring them we'd retrieve them soon. Their discovery of their favorite items being absent left them saddened and in tears. Arlene, still appearing mournful, and I tried our best to console the kids. I have errands to run, I informed them, but I'll be back by 2-ish or 2.30 at the latest. Would you like to go to the park then? I asked, flashing the widest smile I could manage. This transformed their tears into smiles. I received hugs from them, and just as I was about to leave, Arlene approached me and inquired, Where are you going? I gave a cold glance and remarked, most likely to gather evidence of your unfaithfulness, before swiftly departing without a backward glance. The photographs of Arlene and her lover, Jack, trailed from her second and third Friday nights out were precisely what I had anticipated, though the specific location surprised me slightly. The private investigator had warned that capturing usable evidence of their affair indoors might prove challenging. However, they were foolish enough to engage in intimate activities on Trailer's deck and in his swimming pool, clearly visible from numerous vantage points where privacy couldn't be expected. Additionally, the investigator's report indicated that they arrived at Trailer's residence after dinner on Friday night and departed in Arlene's car shortly before 11 p.m. The investigator didn't tail them, but they returned around 2.15 a.m., after which Arlene departed alone at 3 a.m. I visited Kinko's, made three copies of all documents except for a DVD, and then proceeded to meet with Officer Smithson, arriving around 1.15 p.m. He promptly introduced me to Detective June Grayson, a robbery investigator who was as attractive as the female cops portrayed on TV, a rarity. I hadn't imagined she existed in real life. Not only was she stunning, but she was also highly intelligent. After examining the evidence, Grayson spontaneously remarked, It seems your wife and this trailer fellow were out during the time of your burglary. Your security system records show that all systems were deactivated at 11.50 p.m. Just to be thorough, where were you at that time? I was at my sister's place, I casually responded. Can anyone confirm that? she inquired. I doubt it, I replied. I believe they were all asleep, but feel free to ask them. Suddenly, I had a revelation and exclaimed, Wait a minute. I think Bill, my brother-in-law, has security cameras, and I remember going to my car at some point to retrieve forgotten pills. Maybe that can help establish a timeline. Can we obtain the footage from your brother-in-law? Grayson asked. I chuckled. I think Bill is pretty tech-savvy. It's probably on a DVD, I said as I reached for my cell phone and called Jen's house. Bill picked up. Hey Bill, do you have security camera footage from last night? I chuckled again at his response. Could you bring the DVD, my apologies for calling it a tape, to Detective Grayson at the local precinct? She'll explain why when you drop it off. I need to take the kids to the park. Thanks. I grinned at Grayson and Smithson. Exactly as I suspected, he's well equipped with modern technology and has a DVD. He mentioned he'd bring it promptly. Unless there's something else urgent you need to discuss, I have to take the kids to the park. Thank you, Mr. Weston, Grayson replied, smiling and rising to shake my hand. We'll inform you within the next few days if we require anything further. I'll be available, I responded, returning the smile and shaking both her and Smithson's hands. I understand you know what you're doing, but as I mentioned to Officer Smithson last night, you need access to Arlene's computer and desk drawers. I'd appreciate it if you obtained a warrant for those and mine as well, just to be thorough. Grayson simply grinned. I left the original evidence including the sole DVD copy of Arlene and Trailer's Encounter, at my lawyer's office. He typically works on Saturdays. I instructed him to store it in his safe for the time being. I brought the other two copies home, placing one in my desk immediately upon arrival and leaving the other, minus Friday night's report, on the living room coffee table. I took the kids to the park, and despite Arlene's insistence on joining us, I kept myself occupied with the children, ignoring her attempts at conversation. 
Back home, I involved the kids in preparing dinner to avoid being alone with Arlene. Afterward, I engaged in games and bedtime stories with them before retiring. Descending to the living room later, I found Arlene holding the envelope I had left on the coffee table, her complexion strained. Austin, we need to have a serious conversation, she began, her voice trembling. Why? I responded, feigning confusion. Will talking change the fact that you cheated with Trailer, snatching my car keys? I exited, tuning out her protestations. You know it's a no-fault state, and I'll get custody of the kids if we divorce. We can work through this. My sole reaction was to gesture rudely at her. Upon returning four hours later, I immediately retreated to the guest room, barricaded the door with a chair, and fell asleep. Sunday turned out to be one of the most uncomfortable days of my life. It's incredibly challenging to ignore someone sharing the same space with you for hours on end, but apart from interacting with the kids, I made a point of not responding to anything she said. Sunday night, after putting the kids to bed, I was watching TV when she approached me with an insurance claim form. I need you to sign this so I can fax it to the insurance company for reimbursement of our stolen property. I glanced at it, grabbed a pen and paper, jotted down the fax number in the insurance company's department, and uttered the only words I spoke to her all day in the absence of the kids. I'm not signing it, and if you forge my signature, I'll have you arrested for fraud. As Arlene yelled at me, I continued watching TV. When her noise became too much, I put on headphones, plugged them into the TV, and tuned her out. Eventually, she stormed off in tears. I observed her heading to the fax machine to send out the claim form. After she retired to bed, I penned a letter and faxed it to the same address she had sent the form to. My letter stated, although I currently lack concrete evidence. I have a suspicion that my wife may be implicated in the burglary and subsequent loss that she reported to you earlier tonight via claim form. I am refraining from making any claims until the police investigation concludes, and I caution against accepting any documents bearing my signature before then, as they would likely be forgeries. Feel free to reach out to me on my cell phone x6x6x6. This reassured them, especially when I mentioned they could enjoy a soft drink, a rare treat for them. When Grayson discovered that Arlene's desk drawers were locked, he inquired, Who has the key to these? Arlene, visibly nervous, responded, I'm the only one with a key. I'll need you to unlock it, Grayson instructed. Why? Arlene questioned. Because the warrant permits us to search, and I'd rather not damage your furniture, Grayson clarified. Arlene retrieved her keys from her purse and proceeded to unlock the drawers, repeating the process from my desk. While Arlene was in a panic when they confiscated her computer, I remained composed. When they took mine, her distress escalated upon discovering an envelope from a storage rental facility in her desk. What's this? she shrieked. I've never seen it before, Grayson said dryly. I thought you were the only one with the key. I am. Someone must have picked the lock, easy to verify. We'll take the drawer containing the lock cylinder and have our technicians assess it. Grayson replied casually. This response was not what Arlene had hoped for, but it was inevitable. After the police departed, Arlene was frantic. Why are they doing this? What does the warrant say? She fretted. I handed her the warrant and remarked, perhaps they suspect the theft was an inside job. She looked stunned as I left for the deck with the children. Tuesday turned out to be a dreadful day for Arlene. Her sole silver lining came from driving the children to school around 11 a.m. While at work, she was served with divorce papers alleging adultery. By 2 p.m., Detective Grayson and two other officers showed up at her workplace to apprehend her for theft, leading her away in handcuffs. Earlier that Tuesday morning, Detective Grayson had phoned me to meet him at a storage facility not far from our home to identify our stolen belongings. It didn't take me long to recognize our property, just about 30 seconds. Upon inspection, 
I found that everything was there except for my Rolex watch and a set of gold cufflinks. After Arlene's arrest, Detective Grayson contacted me to provide details of the situation, ensuring I wasn't left in the dark and allowing me to arrange for the children's care. Later that afternoon, Arlene appeared before a magistrate and was granted bail set at $50,000. She reached out to me following her hearing. Austin, I'm calling you from jail. Please don't hang up, Arlene pleaded. I didn't realize adultery was a criminal offense. What landed you in jail, Arlene? I asked, dripping with sarcasm, already knowing the answer. They're accusing me of robbing our house, can you believe it? It's absurd, she sobbed. I find it hard to believe. Wasn't it because you were planning to leave me? I asked with a hint of glee. No, no, that's ridiculous. We can discuss it later. Can you come bail me out? If we both agree to use the house as collateral, I could be out in an hour. Please, Austin, why not call your lover, Trailer? I'm sure he can assist, I snapped before hanging up, hearing her start to scream. On Wednesday morning, my lawyer submitted an urgent request for a protective order while Arlene was still in custody. Whether she failed to contact Trailer or he refused to assist, I wasn't concerned about the reason. My lawyer appealed to the court for the protective order, citing Arlene's alleged theft of my belongings and those of our children as grounds for barring her entry into the house. The judge postponed the hearing until Arlene was released on bail, which reportedly occurred after her parents posted it on Thursday. She was instructed to proceed directly to the family law court for a hearing regarding the protective order. Arlene's attorney contended that she deserved the presumption of innocence regarding the theft charges and had never physically harmed or threatened any family member. Conversely, my lawyer argued that the disappearance of my two most valuable pieces of jewelry suggested a propensity for theft. The judge's decision seemed to compromise between the two arguments. We acknowledge the presumption of innocence, however, Mr. Weston retains the right to ensure the security of his property. Consequently, Mrs. Weston may return to the marital home during the ongoing divorce proceedings, but she must wait until Saturday to do so. During this time, Mr. Weston is entitled to have any room in the house secured with a new lock to which Mrs. Weston does not possess a key, and she is strictly prohibited from entering that room. The court must be notified of the designated room by Monday. Any other matters? I pressed my lawyer for another condition, Your Honor. My client insists that Mr. Trailer, the individual with whom Mrs. Weston is involved, be barred from entering the Weston residence or having any contact with the Weston children until the divorce proceedings conclude, he stated. I won't bring him around or involve him with the children, Arlene shouted, rising from her seat, surprising both her attorney and the judge. Mrs. Weston has assured that she won't, which should suffice for you, Mr. Weston, the judge remarked. Although tempted to express my disbelief with an expletive, I managed to restrain myself. I arranged for Lowe's to install a new door to the master bedroom and reinforce its frame. Additionally, I had a sophisticated lock fitted, one that was nearly impregnable. All of Arlene's belongings were relocated to the guest room. Arlene returned home on Saturday morning, the children were happy to see her, but I mostly kept my distance, only interacting when necessary for childcare to avoid upsetting them. Arlene wanted to discuss things. I told her we could talk on Sunday night after the kids had gone to bed. We spoke in the den with the door closed to avoid disturbing the children. After an uncomfortable silence, I urged Arlene to start the conversation, since she was the one who wanted to talk. Well, Austin, I can't help but suspect you're involved in this theft, she began, before I interrupted, whoa, I was expecting an apology for cheating and hurting me so deeply, Arlene, but I suppose that's not on your agenda, is it? I said sarcastically. Austin, once you calm down, we can discuss rekindling our love and putting aside talk of divorce, but I need to resolve my legal issues first, she said. Arlene, let me be crystal clear, even for someone as self-centered as you, 
There's no talk of divorce. I'm filing for divorce, plain and simple. It's over, I asserted firmly. But, Austin, she began to plead, and I cut her off again. This conversation will only be productive if you're willing to hear and accept my terms, I said forcefully. Are you ready to listen? She nodded. I will amend the grounds for divorce to irreconcilable differences. I'll seek sole custody of the children, but you'll have unrestricted visitation, alternating major holidays in two weeks in the summer, provided they're not exposed to any other man unless you're married to him. Our assets will be divided equally, with you responsible for child support for one child and half of the mortgage payments. Once Crystal turns 19, we'll sell the house and split the proceeds. There will be no alimony for either of us, I stated firmly, fixing her with a penetrating stare. But she began, only to be interrupted once more. I'm not done. If you agree, I'll appeal to the DA to reduce your charges to a misdemeanor with no jail time, given a no-contest plea. That way, you can retain your law license and job. Deal? I concluded. But I didn't do anything, she protested, tears streaming down her face as she wrung her hands. I know you orchestrated this whole situation to retaliate against me. I don't want a divorce, but if it comes to that, I'll never agree to you having sole custody, she cried out amidst her tears. So, you refuse to accept any responsibility for the breakdown of our marriage or the theft, huh? I demanded, my voice rising as I stood up. And you're not even the least bit sorry, as if I should be content being deceived. God, how did I ever marry you in the first place? I lamented. She buried her face in her hands as I urged, consider this offer, Arlene. If you don't, it could spell ruin for you. As I left the room, she cried out, but if only you'd listen. I could explain everything. You have to hear me out, or at least, that's what I think she said. By the time she finished speaking, I had already closed the door to the den and couldn't be certain. Two days later, upon returning home, I found the children absent, replaced by Arlene and Jack Trailer seated in the family room. What the hell is he doing here? I shouted at Arlene. You promised the court you wouldn't bring him around. Austin, you need to hear us out, she pleaded. Once you listen, he'll leave and never bother you again. Get out of here, trailer. I thundered. He rose with a mix of aggression and supplication in his eyes. He may have had three inches and thirty pounds on me, but I firmly believed in the adage that it's the size of the fight in the dog, not the dog in the fight. I'd never back down from a confrontation in my life, even if it meant taking a beating, and this wouldn't be the first time. Trailer approached me slowly, attempting to convey something, but amidst my repeated shouts of get the hell out, at the top of my lungs, I couldn't discern his words. After persistently yelling my demand about two dozen times, it became evident he wasn't going to comply. I marched towards the phone to dial 911, annoyed. He yanked the phone cord from the wall, insisting, just listen for God's sake. Undeterred, I reached for my cell phone to make the call. He snatched it away and threw it to the ground, arguing, it'll only take two minutes and it'll restore your life. As I headed towards the garage through the kitchen, he grabbed my jacket, but I wriggled free and dashed out unnoticed by him. I grabbed a meat tenderizer from the kitchen counter and rushed into the breezeway leading to the garage. Abruptly turning back when he followed into the breezeway, I struck him in the forehead with the mallet. He staggered back into the kitchen sink, hands clutching his bleeding head as he screamed and tried to stem the bleeding. I delivered a forceful kick to his groin. Arlene, now in the kitchen crying, provided her phone from her purse on the table, dialing 911. I explained, there's an intruder in my home who attacked me, and I struck him with a mallet. He needs medical assistance, and I need the police to apprehend him. I entered through the front door and calmly settled at the kitchen table while Arlene tended to him. The rapid response of the paramedics amazed me, they arrived in under five minutes. The police followed closely, 
just a minute behind them. He was taken away in an ambulance under restraint. The police accepted my account of events. I requested, did they take my damaged cell phone to check for fingerprints to corroborate my story, along with the phone records if necessary? Additionally, my suit jacket was torn during the incident, so I asked them to take it as evidence. Through her tears, all Arlene could convey to the police was a repeated statement, we just wanted to talk to him. The following day, my lawyer appeared in court. Once more, the judge was furious and instructed Arlene to vacate the residence within 48 hours and cover the cost of changing the locks. Any visitation with her children would be postponed until after the divorce proceedings. The judge postponed the divorce until the resolution of the criminal case against Arlene. I persuaded Detective Grayson to obtain search warrants for Trailer's car and house, as well as Arlene's car. In Trailer's vehicle, they discovered my gold cufflinks. Inside Arlene's trunk, they found a gift labeled Jack with a heart containing my Rolex watch. Trailer was also arrested for theft due to the cufflinks, and because his fingerprints were the only ones found on the basement window through which the thief entered my house, as confirmed by fingerprint results. Contrary to my advice, Arlene chose to contest the criminal charges. It seemed she believed, correctly as it turned out, that winning the criminal trial was her only chance to gain custody of the children. The prosecution presented a strong case, a woman resembling Arlene with a flashy emerald ring and blonde hair rented the storage unit where the stolen items were discovered shortly after Arlene's initial team-building exercise. Only Arlene's fingerprints were found on the lock of the storage unit, adding to the evidence discussed earlier, which formed a compelling prima facie case for the prosecution. During their defense, Arlene and Trailer testified. Arlene admitted that she had four close contacts with Trailer but claimed that she did not leave his house until 3 a.m. last Friday morning. Questioning the credibility of a private investigator, she claimed, I must have been the one who stole the items and framed her, although she couldn't explain how I could have done so since she admitted that she didn't believe I had access to the safe or her desk drawer, and her keys were always in her possession. Arlene attributed the rental of the storage unit to mistaken identity and suggested that her fingerprints were planted on the lock. Both Trailer and Arlene appeared confrontational and indifferent to the impact of her infidelity on her family. During my interrogation by the defense counsel, which lasted for three hours, the prosecutor and Detective Grayson commended my performance. They remarked that I came across as assertive yet cooperative and highly credible. Following my cross-examination, the prosecution called upon Detective Grayson to clarify that it was impossible for me to have committed the theft. She pointed out that surveillance footage at Jen and Bill's house showed me entering at 11.20 p.m. and not leaving, with my car remaining parked, while the break-in indicated by the alarm deactivation occurred at 11.50. According to Detective Grayson, in numerous tests, the quickest response time from Jen and Bill's house by patrolman at that hour of the night was 9 minutes and 32 seconds. Additionally, Detective Grayson testified that I did not possess a key to the safe, the only two keys belonged to Arlene, who kept one in her purse, and the other was in the safe deposit box she stated. That I hadn't visited the safe deposit box for over three months prior to the initial team building session, an expert confirmed the accuracy of Bill's DVD recording time, as well as the reliability of my alarm system. After the case went to the jury, Arlene and Trailer sensed that the outcome wouldn't be favorable and attempted to negotiate a deal with the prosecutor for lesser charges, a suggestion I had previously made to Arlene. Arlene even agreed to grant me sole custody of the children. When the prosecutor sought my opinion, I deferred to her authority but expressed my inclination to let the jury decide. Considering the expenses and troubles of a trial, ultimately the prosecutor followed through with a trial and the jury returned a verdict in less than two hours, finding Arlene guilty on all counts, including theft and insurance fraud, and Trailer guilty of theft and assault. Arlene received a three-year jail sentence along with five years of probation, and the Bar Association initiated disbarment proceedings against her due to her felony conviction.
as Trailer had prior misdemeanor convictions and his assault on me was deemed a special circumstance because it occurred in my home, he was sentenced to four years in jail, five years of probation, in order to compensate for the damages to my cell phone and suit jacket. After the criminal trial, the divorce proceeded effortlessly despite Arlene's attempts to plead her case through her attorney while she was incarcerated, they were disregarded. The marriage ended due to her adultery. I gained full custody of the children, provided child support for three years, and extended it upon Arlene's release from prison, along with acquiring the house. Our remaining assets, excluding Arlene's legal expenses, were divided equally. She was also obligated to cover my attorney's fees. Exiting the courtroom with my brother-in-law and closest friend Bill, he wore a satisfied grin. What's making you smile like that? I inquired. Come on, Austin. Spill the beans. How did you manage it? He eagerly asked. Manage what? I chuckled. What I didn't tell Bill, but will share with you, is that I orchestrated the entire theft scheme. I was immediately suspicious of the team building excuse from the start. To confirm my suspicions, I had a colleague call HR at Arlene's workplace. If HR hadn't heard of it, I knew it was fabricated. On the first Friday night of the supposed teen building, I had already arranged for a local high school senior to babysit. She arrived promptly after Arlene left, and I paid her $50 for her service, along with an extra $100 to ensure her silence about that night. I ensured Arlene's cell phone emitted a signal that my smartphone app could pick up, confirming it before she departed that Friday evening. Once the babysitter arrived, I used the app to track Arlene's whereabouts. I located her with a man I didn't recognize at a restaurant I'd never heard of. Disguised, I approached a busboy, offering him a hundred to bring me a glass that Arlene's date had handled and drank from. I waited until Arlene and her companion left the restaurant, watching them kiss as she got into his car. Still in disguise, I followed them and surreptitiously took a picture of the license plate on my cell phone. By Monday afternoon, I had identified Arlene's companion as Jack Trailer and found out his place of residence. Having hired a private investigator, I organized surveillance of Arlene during the second and third Friday sessions which led to photographic evidence of close encounters. I instructed the investigator not to provide a report until after her fourth Friday team building session, which allowed me to plausibly deny my guilt until then. By Sunday evening, I had developed a comprehensive plan, including strategies for obtaining custody of children in the event of a divorce. On the first Monday before heading to work, I took Arlene's unique emerald ring from her jewelry box. She never wore it to work but always put it on when going out. I hired an actress who matched Arlene's size, had a wig with the same color and style of hair, and wore her emerald ring on her finger. I rented a storage facility cube in Arlene's name, paying three months' rent in cash in advance. By Tuesday, I had obtained some key impressioning clay while Arlene slept that night. I quietly took her keys from her purse and made impressions of her house safe and desk keys the next day. Upon arriving home early from work, I used an alloy slug, a quick melting metal, to fashion duplicates of those keys, ensuring I wore gloves throughout. That evening, I replaced the padlock and asked Arlene if she recognized it or possessed a key for it. After examining both, she replied negatively. If you don't need it for anything else, I'd like to use it to secure my tool shed, she said. Sure, I responded, as she walked away. I preserved the lock in a plastic bag, hoping her fingerprints would linger on it along with the key. Two days before the theft, I marked waypoints along the wooded path between my home and Jen's house using reflectors. On the night of the theft, I accessed Jen's desk drawer, leaving an envelope containing the facility's front door access code and a key marked with her fingerprints, a duplicate forged for me at a hardware store, through the same agent who had previously rented the facility. I arranged for the rental of a van equipped with a motorcycle rack, assisted by her boyfriend, who secured a dirt bike for me. I concealed the bike among trees behind Jen and Bill's residence. 
Furthermore, I obtained Arlene's laptop password from a list found in her securely locked drawer. After setting up a new email account, I drafted an email to Jack, supposedly from Arlene, expressing excitement about meeting up and insinuating our plan would provide financial stability from my stolen property, while she pursued a divorce. I hired the actress and her boyfriend to be available on the fourth Friday night of the team building sessions. Their task was to use Arlene's car spare key to drive it away from the side of Jack's house. Prior to this, I ensured the boyfriend could unlock Jack's car using a tool and strategically placed my gold cufflinks in the car. Earlier that day, I parked the van in my garage and disabled the automatic garage door opener. Two days prior, I transferred Jack's fingerprints from a glass at a restaurant onto his basement window, allowing me easy access using cocoa powder and a small paintbrush. Before my conversation with Arlene, where I begged her not to leave on the fourth Friday, I hadn't fully committed to carrying out my plan. I truly believed that if she had stayed home and ended things with Jack, we might have reconciled. But her defiance extinguished any lingering affection I had and I decided to move forward with my plan. Unwittingly, Bill had helped by answering my questions weeks earlier about a particular basement window that wasn't covered by cameras. After receiving confirmation from the actress that she and her boyfriend had left Jack's place before 11 p.m., I quickly accessed the basement window and proceeded with the theft, disabling alarms and securing the stolen items. I methodically disconnected communication lines disabled backups, and accessed the safe using the duplicate key from Arlene. Within hours, I had emptied the safe, transported the items, and stored them, locking the container with Arlene's fingerprinted lock. After returning the van, I dropped off the keys and quietly left. I hid the dirt bike among the trees, re-entered Bill's house through the window, and reattached the fake bars. The unexpected bonus of Jack's visit to my house and his subsequent actions added to my satisfaction. As for Arlene's reasons for her affair or any related details, they remained a mystery. Maybe if I had been more attentive during uncertain times, I might have learned more. But her rejection ended my concern. I had taken my revenge, and now they must live with the consequences. Thank you for listening to today's story. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. Take care.